Snap. Snap is right. It is welcome uh, to Learning Live, day five, with these incredible three authors that all week long we like have learned, we have laughed, um, and today we get to have each author uh, share, like, tell a story. That's our theme for the day, and I know that like this is a big like. You're kicking us off for the weekend. So this is absolutely fabulous. I think we're starting with Roland Smith. Um, and then I know Jack Gantos. And then I think Jerry Pilata, you're you're going to be the caboose today uh, uh, as we get ready for our fifth day. So Jamie, any instructions? Yeah, I. you know, it's been wonderful to see responses. If you notice you're not able to respond in the chat, it's because you're not signed into YouTube. So it does require you to have an account um, with Google. And if you're signed in there, you should be able to go into the chat and respond. Um, we definitely want to hear from you and hear feedback and ideas and questions so that the authors have a chance to respond to that. And if you haven't already, definitely subscribe to Learning Live so that you're notified about future live um, interactions that we'll have. So we're really excited to hear them today read their books and, and interact with all of us. That's it. That's it. I'm up. I'm up. Um, I should tell you, first of all, that I, I don't actually ever read my books again. I mean, because I wrote them, I know it's in them. And uh, I'm always afraid when I'm reading a book, I'm going to want to correct something I did in the book. And so I saved myself that aggravation by not reading the books again. I mean, if I'm writing a sequel, of course, I'll read a book again to make sure I remember what was in that book. But um, normally, I don't do that. And when I go to schools or I speak at uh, uh, bookstores and stuff, they always say, hey, read your book aloud. And I actually never do that. And the reason I don't do that is because I presume that everybody in the audience can already read. That's why they're there. And that they're probably more interested in hearing about how I write a book and so forth. But today I am going to make an exception to that. And I'm going to read like one chapter from um, this little book called Peak. Um, which some of you out there may know. It's, it's a pretty popular book. Um, because I'm not going to read the first chapter, I'm going to read the second chapter. I should tell you kind of what this book is about really quickly. Um, so this is a book about climbing Mount Everest. And the kid, the protagonist, the main character, the viewpoint character is a, is a boy named Peak, P-E-A-K. And his parents are both world-class climbers and they named him Peak and he was just happy he wasn't called Grandpa or some other climbing term. So he was called Peak, his name is Peak Marcello. And he gets in trouble in New York and he has to get out of town really quick. And he ends up going to Tibet to climb the northern side of Mount Everest. And I should mention this, uh, Mount Everest actually is closed this year which is real bad news for all the people that got in shape to climb Mount Everest this year. Uh, but the good news is no one's going to die on Mount Everest this year because nobody's climbing it, which is a really, which is a really good thing. Um, in this story, one of the peaks assignment from school is to actually write a book or a journal. And so peak is basically, this book is really a journal. So it's written in his viewpoint. And I'm going to start reading the second chapter, which is called The Hook. He has a, an English teacher, or uh, as they call it in his fancy uh, private school, a literary mentor. And so he's kind of writing this book for his mentor. And so the, the second chapter is called The Hook, because he's been talked about when you write a novel, how you put a hook into it. And so this is that chapter, The Hook. I was only two thirds of the way up the wall when the sleet started to freeze onto the black terracotta. My fingers were numb. My nose was running. I didn't have a free hand to wipe my nose or enough rope to rappel about 500 feet to the ground. I had planned everything out so carefully except for the weather. And now it was uh-oh time. A gust of wind tried to peel me off the wall. I dug my fingers into the seam and hugged the terracotta until it passed. I should have waited until June to make the ascent, but no, moron, has to go up in March. Why? Because everything was ready and I have a problem with waiting. I had studied the wall, built my custom protection and picked the date. I was ready. And if the date passed, I might not, I might not try it at all. It doesn't take much to talk yourself out of a stunt like this. 
That's why there were six, over 6 billion people sitting safely inside their homes and one moron, I shouted. Option number one, finish the climb. 264 feet up are about 100 precarious finger holds, providing my fingers didn't break off like icicles. Option two, climb down. A little over 500 feet, 250 finger holds. Option three, wait for rescue. Scratch that option. No one knew I was on the wall. By morning, providing someone actually looked up and saw me, I would be an icy gargoyle. And if I lived, my mom would drop me off the wall herself. Up it is then. I timed my moves between vicious blasts of wind, which were becoming more frequent the higher I climbed. The sleet turned to hail, pelting me like a swarm of frozen hornets. But the worst happened about 30 feet from the top, 15 measly finger holds away. I stopped to give the lactic acid searing my shoulders and arms a chance to simmer down. I was mouth breathing, partly from exertion, partly from terror. And I told myself I would make the final push as soon as I caught my breath. While I waited, a thick mist drifted in around me. The top of the wall disappeared, which was just as well. When you're tired and scared, 30 feet looks about the length of two football fields. And that can be pretty demoralizing. Scaling a wall happens one foothold and one handhold at a time. Thinking beyond that can weaken your resolve. And it's your will that gets you up to the top as much as your muscles and climbing skills. Finally, I started breathing through my runny nose again, kind of snorting really. And I was able to close my mouth every other breath. This is it, I told myself, 15 more handholds and I've topped it. I reached up for the next seam and encountered a little snag. Well, a big snag really. My right ear and cheek were frozen to the wall. To reach the top, you must have resolve, muscles and skill and a face. Mine was an anchor to that wall like a bolt and a portion of it stayed there when I gathered enough resolve to tear it loose. Now I was mad, which was exactly what I needed to finish the climb. Cursing with every vertical lunge, I stopped about four feet below the edge, tempted to tag this monster with blood, with the blood running down my neck. But instead, I took the mountain stencil out of my pack, cheating I know, but I have to have two free hands to do it freehand, slapped it on the wall, and filled it in with the blue spray paint. This is when the helicopter came up behind me and nearly blew me off the wall. You are under arrest, an ampl amplified voice shouted above the deafening rotors. I looked down. Most of the mist had been swirled away by the chopper rotors. And for the first time in an hour, I could see the busy street 800 feet below the skyscraper. A black rope dropped down next to me and two alarmed and angry faces leaned over the edge of the roof. Take the rope. I wasn't about to take the rope four feet from my goal. I started up. Take the rope. When my head reached the top of the railing, they hauled me up and cuffed my wrists behind my back. They were wearing SWAT gear and NYPD baseball caps, and there were a lot of them. One of the cops leaned close to my bloody ear. What were you thinking, he said, then jerked me to my feet and handed me off to a regular street cop. Get this moron to emergency. There you go. So that's the second chapter of Peak. And we haven't really talked about this much, but all of our books, not just my books, are, you know, they're widely available online. You can get them on Audible. If you're not doing anything this weekend, which most people aren't, you should read a book, you know, not just our books, but anybody's books. And you can get these things without even going out of your house, which is a good thing to do. Okay. Jack? Wow. Wow, that was great. Excellent. Excellent. I love that chapter. I worked really hard on that chapter. I think you got it all. I think you just nailed it. Um, so I was wondering what I was going to uh, read because like Roland, usually I just, uh, when I go to a, a school, I just tell the story. I just stand up there and, 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 and unload a story on them. And then I break the story down into all of its basic elements and then teach out of that. But the story, um, I don't read out of a book. 
It's a different kind of experience. So I'll read a piece of this, but I'll set you up anyway. So this is uh, Dead End in Norvell. And, uh, and the character in there, uh, Jack, because most of my books are about me, um, the character Jack um, gets bloody noses all the time. So uh, for instance, the book opens up where I have my father's World War II Japanese sniper rifle and I'm standing on a picnic table in my backyard and I've aimed it at the drive-in movie theater about three miles away and I don't know it's loaded. He brought a Japanese sniper rifle back from the Solomon Islands during World War II and he said to me, never touch that gun. Well, of course I did. So at any rate, so uh, it was a war movie. I thought I'd help out. So I pulled the trigger, bam, that thing fired off. Blew me off of the table. And my mother was in the kitchen. She saw this. Looking out the kitchen window, blam, I go flying off. And she screams, I scream, and she comes out like a wild animal. And uh, she lifts me up. She lifts me up literally by the ears. I remember just hanging there by the ears. And she looked at me and the blood is pouring out of my face and it's all over me. And she looks at me and she goes, oh my God, you shot a hole in your face. And I looked right back at her and I said, do you think I'm gonna die? And she said, nothing. And I knew at that moment I was going to die. And then she took her dish, dish towel and she wiped my face off and she said, oh, it's just your bloody nose. You're grounded. So for me to get out of being grounded, I had to go around helping a lot of people. And there's an old lady who lived down the street, Miss Volker. And she had uh, really bad hands. She had really bad claw-like fingers. She had arthritis. And, uh, and she would have to soak them, soak them in hot wax. She would stand in front of the stove with a big spaghetti bucket, spaghetti water bucket full of wax. And she'd soak her hands in there and then she'd pull them out and they'd be good for about 15 minutes. And then they'd tighten up again like that. So at any rate, so I went down there. Um, and the reason I went down there is she was a nurse. She wanted me down there because she wanted to fix my nose. She said, look, your nose is bleeding all the time. I can't have you bleeding all over this town. Your mother wants me to fix your nose. I'm going to fix your nose. I said, okay. So here we are in the kitchen. We're in the kitchen. She is sort of cooking her own hands to get ready to fix my nose. So, so here's how it's going to work, she explained. We'll deaden your nose, and then I'll cook my hands. And when they're working, I'll quickly heat up the cauterizing wire and do the work on you. More than likely, my hands will tire and seize up. So I'll have to recook them and heat up the wire and work on you in shifts, but we'll get it, okay? Are you sure I shouldn't go to a doctor? I ventured. Don't insult me, she said firmly. I'm a nurse and I'm telling you that I can handle this. Nothing is wrong with the iron in your blood. It's just your nose capillaries, which are too bundled up and delicate on the inside surface of your nasal passages. I'll burn them off and you'll be fine. You got that? Easy peasy. I understand, I said, but, but are you sure it will work? These hands have delivered babies, she stated. I've stitched up miles of gaping wounds and set a hundred broken bones and pulled a gallon jar full of rotten teeth. I even had to pop an eyeball back into its socket. So don't question me. Now get onto the table. I climbed up and took my place on the table as if I were one of Mr. Huffer's cadavers. Next to me, she laid out the Q-tips, a magnifying glass, the bottle of anesthetic, and a cauterizing instrument, which was a wooden handle with a six inch long, thickish wire coming out of one end. On the tip of the wire was a tiny scorched blade. As she turned away to heat up her hands, all I could imagine was that she would aim the instrument into a nose hole, have a hand spasm and drive it up my nasal passage into, 
until she jammed the hot little blade into the soft, creamy center of my brain. And I would end up being a babbling idiot for the rest of my life. Go ahead and swab your nasal passages with a good dose of the anesthetic, she instructed. And don't be stingy with it. Believe me, you don't want to feel any of this pain. I sure did. While I swabbed the inside of my nose with a Q-tip, she got busy with cooking her hands. After she removed them from the pot and peeled off the hot wax, she held them up in the air. Watch this and wiggled her rusty fingers back and forth while singing, the itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. That really didn't make me relax. I tried to smile, but I had swabbed on so much anesthetic, my lips were frozen in place like fish in a frozen pond. Then quickly she heated up the wire and pulled it out of the flame. It was red hot and a puff of smoke rose from what I guessed was a little scrap of human tissue that had been stuck on the blade from her last operation. I whimpered. Don't look at it, she ordered. You'll flinch and I'll scorch you. And then you'll really have something to bleed about. How do your hands feel? I asked shakily as she came toward me. Rock steady, she declared. Now close your eyes. I did and waited for the pain. A few minutes later, she asked, did you feel that? Feel what? I replied. If you didn't feel the map pin I just stuck into the tip of your nose, she said, you are ready. Now let's get this done. I'm gonna do it. Okay. I crossed my eyes and looked down at my nose. There was a red topped pin sticking straight out of my nose. But before I could say anything, she came at me. I took a deep breath and clutched the tabletop on either side. I lifted my nose up into the air so she could get a clear view. I felt her dark shadow bend over me. Well, any rate, she got it up there. Scorched me pretty good on one side. Cooked her hand some more. Scorched the other side. And it actually worked. Um, have, you ever, have you ever had another bloody nose? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get them all the time still. I wake up in the morning sometimes. I'm just all like, it looks like my wife has slit my throat with a razor. <laughs> or the cat. Maybe one of them. At any rate, so uh, so that book goes on and this this blood issue is a is a is a running motif in that book. Uh, there was a, a reference to uh, to the uh, to Huffer's funeral home in there and uh, and my friend Bunny Huffer is always taking me in to see bodies, see you know, to see bodies worked over for burial, and then uh, and then I start bleeding like crazy, and she just loves it. You know, she does this all the time. She's always doing something awful, showing me a, a body part her father has removed, and I bleed out all over the place. So it's just nice to have those kinds of things running through, and I liked yours, Roland, like when he stuck his face. On the, on the on the side, and then pe had to peel it off. I was like, "Oh, good! Somebody else is going to have some blood too." Yeah, yeah. A little bit of blood never hurts them. No, it's a good thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Jerry, are you ready? How do I follow that? A face stuck to a building, frozen, and a bloody nose. How do I follow that? With any hey. one of your books. One of my new books is called "Not a Butterfly Alphabet Book." So it's really a book of moths, and uh, someone said, "Why did you? Why don't you call it a moth alphabet?" Well, I don't think anyone would buy a moth alphabet, so I was trying to trick people into buying it by calling it not a butterfly alphabet. My butterfly books sell really well. Why that is, I don't know. So I'm going to read it. Here we go. I'll do my best. A is for Atlas Moth. Maybe I should show them Atlas Moth. I'll get better at this. Here it is. Don't even think about calling this creature a butterfly. This is a moth. The atlas moth is the largest moth in the world. Wingtip to wingtip, this moth can be as wide as this page. B is for bella moth. The word bella means beautiful. Most people think butterflies are more colorful than moths and have more intricate and interesting wings. It's not true. Moths are spectacular too. Here's the, here's the bella. And here's our next one. The cow moth, which I love. 
C is for cow moth. Butterflies and moths land differently. Most butterflies land with their wings folded up. Moths land with their wings spread out. Cow moth, we want to say one thing. Moo. D is for diamond moth. This moth looks like it belongs in a jet book. It's the same shape as a Delta Dart fighter jet. Moths are insects. Insects have six legs. A jet is an aircraft. It does not have legs. It has landing gear instead. There's the Delta moth right there. Pretty cool looking butter moth right there. I almost said butterfly. Uh, here's the uh, next one, emperor moth. Really cool looking moth. How you like that? He is for emperor moth. My, what lovely fake eyes you have. Since birds, tiny mammals, and small reptiles enjoy eating moths, these pretend eyes are perfect for scaring predators away. If a predator catches the moth, it usually eats the body and leaves the wings. F is for fly moth. Nature is truly amazing. This moth has upper wings that mimic red eye flies eating bird poop. Some moths have wing designs that mimic eyes, sticks, and leaves. This moth is also called a mural moth. There you go. I do like that. It is a picture book. There's the fake um, insects eating the fake birdie poop right there. How's that? And then here's the next one. Look at that. Green lips. G is for green lips moth. While walking through the rainforest, look for the green lips moth. No kissing allowed. The green lips moth could be mistaken for a green leaf. It's also known as a giant silkworm moth. It looks like a hummingbird, flies like a hummingbird, sounds like a hummingbird, it eats like a hummingbird. Don't be fooled, it's a moth. H is for hummingbird moth. There it is right there. Hummingbird, whoa, whoa. There it is right, oh man, there. Here's a, a imperial moth. Here's the imperial moth, sorry if I'm giving you a headache. I is for imperial moth. This yellow moth is camouflaged when sitting on a yellow flower. A scientist who collects and studies butterflies and moths is called a lepidopterist. Lepidoptera is the Latin word that means scale wings. What do butterflies, moths, reptiles? I lost a picture on my thing. I don't know what's going on. We okay, you guys? We can see you. Okay. What do butterflies, moths, reptiles, most fish, and two mammals have in common? Scales. A pangolin is a mammal with scales made of keratin. Keratin is what our nails and hair are made of. Lizard. This orange gecko is a lizard that has scales. Moth. This is a close-up of a moth wing. Butterflies and moths have delicate wings with the tiny scales. If you touch them, the scales wipe off and look like dust on your fingers. Snake. Snakes are reptiles that have scales on their skin. Fish. This clownfish is scaly too. Armadillo. An armadillo is a mammal with scales called scutes. Butterflies. The scales on butterflies and moth wings overlap like shingles. So there you go. It's a really beautiful page. All the animals that have scales. There's a pangolin. There's the uh, gecko lizard. There's the uh, there's a moth. There's a fish. They have scales. There's a, a lizard, I believe. No, a snake and an armadillo. And there is a butterfly. They all have scales. J is for Jersey tiger moth. A Jersey tiger moth has hind wings that are entirely different color than its fore wings. This is a moth anatomy lesson. Moths have two antenna, two eyes, a head, a proboscis, a thorax, an abdomen, a pair of fore wings, a pair of hind wings, and six legs. There's the Jersey Tiger Moth, right, right there. K is for Kentish Glory Moth. Sorry, penguins. Moths live on every continent except Antarctica. The Kentish Glory Moth is only found in Scotland. How do you like that, you Scotland folks reading today, uh, watching us today? Is the uh, Kentish Glory. L is for Leopard Moth. Leopards aren't the only animals with spots. Another good name for this moth could have been Dalmatian moth. <clears throat> M is for moon moth. The long hind wings of the moon moth are similar to those of the lunar moth on the title page of this book. 
When long-tailed moths fly, their tails create vibrations that distract their biggest predators, bats. So there you go, there's the uh, leopard moth. And here is the moon moth, my favorite, is the moon moth. N is for uh, nutmeg moth. This moth is named after a spice. Do some research. Are there other moths named after spices or herbs? Is there a parsley moth, sage moth, rosemary moth, thyme moth? O is for oak myrrh moth. Cockroaches, sugar gliders, and skunks are creatures that shy away from light. Moths are the opposite. They are attracted to light. Moths will fly toward a lit candle, lantern, or porch light. Want to get rid of moths? Turn off the lights. There's the nutmeg moth. There's the nutmeg moth right there. And there's the okra moth right there. Here's the okra moth. Cute. P is Pandora sphinx moth. Butterflies usually fly during the day. Moths usually fly at night. The Pandora sphinx moth is most often seen flying at dusk. Q is for Quaker moth. Moths do not have teeth or fangs. They can't bite you and they don't chew their food. Moths drink with their proboscis, which looks and works like a straw. There's the Pandora Sphinx moss right there. Oops, right there, uh, right there. And there is the, whatever I forgot, Quaker moth. Ours for rosy maple moth. The rosy maple moth looks like a tropical insect, but it is actually found on the East Coast forests of North America. It gets its name from eating mostly maple tree leaves. People enjoy the maple flavor too. S is for sheep moth. Butterflies have straight antennae with a bump or a club at the tip. Moths have pointed antennae. Some moths, like these sheep moths, have feathered antennae. So there's the rosy maple moth. He's cute. Uh, and there is the... <laughs> I'm laughing. Sheep moth. T is for tapestry moth. The tapestry moth is also called the carpet moth. These pesky moths get their name because their larvae feed on carpets, fabric, wool, or even bird nests. They can ruin clothing and furniture in your house. If this moth gives you trouble, call an exterminator. U is for underwing moth. There is no such thing as a baby moth. When a moth comes out of its cocoon, it is already an adult. It is a baby during the caterpillar stage. Let's learn about a moth's life cycle on the next page. By the way, there's the tapestry moth right there. This is a picture book. And there is the, for some reason I keep underwing moth. T-U, all right, we're learning about the life cycle. Egg, moths lay lots of eggs. Many of the eggs are eaten by predators. The surviving eggs hatch into ha caterpillars. Caterpillar, caterpillars first eat their eggshell. Then they eat leaves. Then they eat and eat and eat and get fat. Sounds like me. This caterpillar is called a blonde woolly bear. Cocoon. The moth caterpillar then builds a cocoon. The caterpillar is now called a pupa. A butterfly caterpillar turns into a chrysalis, but a moth caterpillar turns into a cocoon. Moth. Eventually the pupa matures and an adult moth emerges. And then there's the life cycle right there. Um, there's the egg, there's the eggs. Whoop, there they are, right there. There's the eggs, there's the caterpillar, right there. There's the blonde woolly bear caterpillar. And then there's the uh, cocoon and there's the butterfly. I missed the moth, excuse me. V is for Venus moth. This moth is fuzzy. It's a myth that moths are hairy and fuzzy and butterflies are not. Both moths and butterflies can be fuzzy wuzzy. W is for wasp moth. Moths do not have claws or nails. A moth cannot scratch you, dig a hole, or get a manicure. How do moths defend themselves against predators? They fly erratically and are difficult to catch. This wasp moth's best defense is that it resembles a nasty stinging wasp. No one wants to mess with a wasp. So there's the um, Venus moth right there. And here's the wasp moth right there. X is for zestia moth. Moths versus butterflies. There are ugly moths and ugly butterflies. There are beautiful moths and beautiful butterflies. Scientists tell us there are 150,000 different species of moths 
There are 20,000 species of butterflies. There are not many moths that begin with the letter X. Y is for yucca moth. What a picky eater. Picky, picky, picky. The yucca moth likes to visit only one type of plant, the yucca. Moths prefer white plants and flowers because they are easy to see at night. So there's the zestia moth right there. And then here's the yucca moth right there. Z is for zigzag moth. Looking through this book, do you see a moth that might be a good design for a shirt, a coat, pants, or a scarf? Zigzag is a funky pattern to try out in your art class. Another word for zigzag is chevron. Remember, this is not a butterfly outfit book. There are zillions children's books about butterflies. This is a moth book. There you go, guys. Thank you very much for letting me read my book. Oh, that's, that's great. great that was really great. I learned a lot. I, I learned a ton. Me too. Who would have known? Yeah, I just have to say once I was at Chaco Canyon out in New Mexico, and uh, I was there at night, and there was a pole with a light on it. And when they closed the canyon, I was still there because I was with an anthropologist. And the rangers stood around the pole with the light and waited for the moths to come. And then they would snatch them and eat them right out of the air. Wow. Really? Yeah. So apparently they also have a lot of protein. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Who well, knew? Before we get to some questions, we have one more special guest reader. Oh. And that would be Ellie. Hi, Ellie. Hi. Hi. Do, do you want to share what you're going to be doing? I'm going to be reading. I forgot story. about Ellie. She should have read before me. No. <laughs> I did. I'm going to read a Who Would Win book. Which one is it? The Lobster versus Crab. Oh. I'm just going to be sharing my favorite parts about it. Okay. So the first part is. Okay. is about which crab and lobster w would it be and first I thought it was going to be the spiny lobster but it was actually the American lobster and the blue crab I thought at first was going to be the lobster and this is where all the crab and lobster live Well, and it's interesting because she's having to learn right now in her classroom about states and capitals. And so when he put it actually on the map, then she goes, oh, I know where that's at. And so she was making a connection to what she was doing with the visuals that he included in it as well. All right. And this one is showing where everything is on the body parts and how just like how it kind of works. <laughs> How about the speed? Do you notice the speed? Speed limit? One and speed limit. 10. Hmm. So looking at how quick it is, I wonder if that has anything to do with who would win. I love how you put facts in there. Yep, fill it full of facts. <laughs> Know that you go lobster hunting, so this is the trap set. Oh, yes. yeah. I'm going to help her get in the right view here. Yep. You catch a lobster with a trap, you catch a crab with a trot line. <laughs> oh, did you know that? No. Why do you ask him about that? He knows all about that. Wait, what? What does that mean? Get a lobster with you catch a lobster with a lobster trap. You put bait in the trap and he walks in the trap. And a trot line is when you put a line out with chicken necks on it and the crabs go after the chicken necks. And as you pull the trot line up, you grab them with a, a butterfly net as they're they won't let go of their food. So you grab them before they figure out they're gonna get caught. How often do you check your um, your traps, Jerry? I would check them every day if it was good weather. Wow. That's really so cool. I'd bait him and I'd check him the next day. The bait might last two days. So then I'd, you know, bait him every two days probably. All right, next is how they're fighting and what they're doing to just like come up on the opponent. Yeah. 
And then. And I honestly thought that the crab was gonna win, and actually the lobster won. So it's pretty cool. She really enjoyed this book. She went through them all, and actually, because she had already told us earlier which one she was gonna do, she started to say, "Oh man, I should have done the ultimate jungle rumble, or I should have done this." She was going through the visuals, and both of us agreed that they are so eye capturing, aren't they? Like they're yeah. just, they really capture our students to want to read. And I know for Ellie, this really made an impact for her. And don't the kids fight over the who would win books at the school? Yeah. One day I went went to the library and I was just like, do you have any who would win books? She's like, we're all, we're all gone. And I, I asked how many were there and there's 20 like in like the pack, like duplicates and stuff. So she, she went and they're all, they were all gone. Why were they gone? Because everybody loves them to read them. See Apparently, them. the kids steal your books at school in the <laughs> library, and then they don't return them. So what a what a great problem to have, your kids stealing your books. Um, so anyways, we just thought Ellie would want to jump in and kind of share from her perspective as a student and how it's really impacted her um, to want to read. So thank you, Jerry, for what you do. Thank you, Ellie. I know next year, though, you'll forget all about me, and you'll read Jack's books and Roland's books. <laughs> oh, it's, okay. it's okay. We'll still be friends. She will forget. <laughs> hey, we have a bunch of comments and some questions, and I'm just going to start at the top. Okay. Greg Schroeder says, uh, gentlemen, I like it that he calls us gentlemen. Uh -huh. What has been your greatest experience or thrill as an author? And uh, I'll start just because I'm here. I... Um, I'm pretty thrilled whenever I finish a book. I mean, that's really the most thrilling part for me. I'm done. And that's usually about a year before it comes out. I'm actually thrilled that the book is there and it's going to be published and stuff like that. So for me, after working on a book for a year or longer, um, getting that book done and, and then thinking that it's okay for me is thrilling. And even though I've written almost 50 books, um, that doesn't go away for me. I, I'm still thrilled the same way I was when my first book came out. Um, all the other ones, I'm just as thrilled as I was with the first one uh, that comes out. It's a thrilling thing to spend the effort and end up with something that's um, hopefully readable for people. So for me, that's that's really what is really thrilling for me. I kind of work towards that goal, finish that finish that book and, and try to get that feeling. And uh, it happens when I finish a book most of the time. I mean, I don't send a book in unless I get that feeling, by the way. I'll hold on to that until that feeling kind of comes to me and I go, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good book. How about you, Jack? Wow. Um, that really is one of the defining moments of feeling good, is when you have finished it and when you know it's good, when you know it's finished, because you've put those 50 drafts in, maybe more, maybe 100 drafts, and you remember working on it when it was just a noodled idea, just a little nothing. And then you worked on it and worked on it and built that thing up. And so by the time you are ready to turn it in and it's polished, you really are ready to turn it in. And mm -hmm. You're like, I love you, but beat it. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. I'll feel good about the next book now. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it, it kind of comes in that cycle. On the other side, then it's gone. It's been away from you for a while. Then it comes out. Then you look at the reviews. Then the reviews start coming in. And then you can get a second layer of, of joy or despair out of, out of that. And then, and then the awards come out. So, so a book kind of has these, these moments, but the one that you are in control of is the writing of the book. You can't do the reviews. You can't do the awards. You do the book. And that's where the effort goes. So when you launch it, that's really the greatest piece. How about you, Jerry? I think I've always told kids, uh, my favorite thing is to think of a really creative idea. I think that's really something. Sometimes it takes years and years before you get a really different creative idea. So like when I thought of who would win, Kill the World versus Great White Shark, that was a big thrill to be able to think of that. But the other thing is when I started visiting schools 25 years ago, 35 years ago, whatever, and I'd walk into a school and the kids were writing books based on my books. I thought that was really cool mm -hmm. that the kids were 
using my books as models to write their own books. That was really something. Mm -hmm. So there you go. This is kind of this is kind of related to this a little bit, and and all all three of us visit. I don't know. We we were talking about earlier. We maybe ten thousand schools. Ten thousand schools. Of them. Yeah. So uh, Susan Hutchins says, uh, "What's the funniest thing a student has ever said to you?" Oh. You want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. I don't care. A kid came up to me and said, "I should write Donald Trump versus Baby Ninja." <laughs> wow. Who would win? Another kid told me I should write apple versus orange. Another kid said I should write cheeseburger versus hot dog. So I would say those are pretty cool kids, you know? What do you think, Jack? <laughs> well, sticking with the theme, kid raised his hand and I said, yes. He said, your nose is bleeding. <laughs> 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 and another kid once said, Mr. Gantos, yes. He said, your zipper's down. <laughs> so I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't mean that. So yeah. I had that happen to me in front of 400 kids. A little kid runs up and I'm like, oh no. Do oh. I give him the microphone? Yeah. The fly is down. Oh. Yeah. Nice. No, I, I know. And they kind of. Like they're just helpful. They're just very helpful. They're nice. Well, not, not always. I, I was at a uh, school and you know, you get a lot of the same kind of questions and they're all great questions. And uh, when you're talking to younger kids, um, Jack and I both speak a lot of middle school to older kids, but for younger kids, you, you have to kind of tell them what a question is. You know, it starts with who, what, where, why, and has that thing at the end called a question mark. Just so, because th they'll say things like, uh, my dog died and you go, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But, um, that's not a question. And the same little girl raise her hand and say, did you know my dog died? <laughs> you know, I've had that happen several times. My favorite question of all time, the question that stunned me, you know, I'm always kind of kidding with kids while I'm talking to them and a little, and I lectured in them. I told them to ask questions and a little girl raised her hand and she goes, she leaned, she goes, what is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> which is a question and I said you know that's a question but I I have more problems than I can enumerate and she raised her hand again and she goes what is enumerate and I love that I, I actually love getting stumped by questions by kids yeah I had a kid ask me you know I'm from Boston so I talk funny and I was down in Chattanooga and a second grader goes are you an American <laughs> hang on here we have some more questions jerry this is for you how long did it take you to research the moth book uh believe it or not i worked on that book for five years i mm -hmm. didn't work on it all at once i worked on it then i put it away then i worked on it then i put it away then i worked on it the illustrator vanished for a couple of years didn't do any pictures for a while then she came back did some more moths did the book I worked on it for five years. So, That's a long time. Um, well, I had already written a butterfly counting book and I had written a butterfly um, uh, alphabet book. So I was always in and out of moths, butterflies, moths, butterflies. So, you know, over the years, I learned a lot of the facts that are in that book. So I, I already know the answer to this question um, because Marie and I have written a couple um, kind of alphabet books, but um, can you explain what the hardest letter is to pick in an alphabet book. Hmm. I can tell you the hardest letter I've ever had is a D vegetable. Oh. A kid about, told me Doritos. <laughs> what about X? Is that hard? Not always hard. Like mm -hmm. if you're doing jets, it's easy. Airplanes, easy. Uh, moths, it was pretty easy to find an X moth, you know? Uh, Kind of hard in the ocean finding X, you know. Uh, believe it or not, when I go to schools, this is really interesting. The letter H for kids' names seems to be the hardest. Hmm. You know, like there's a lot of Xavier's, there's, there's a lot of Quinns and Quintons. H seems to be kind of tough when you're doing an outfit of kids' names. Hmm. Hmm. Happened to Harold. 
Did Harold just go they out? Don't make, they don't make Harold's anymore. They don't make Harold anymore? How about no. Harvey? What happened to Harvey? He's gone too. Damn. Hannah, yeah, there are a lot of Hannahs. Yeah. 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 Maybe Houdini can bring them back. So well, I'm looking at the questions. There's lots of comments. Yeah. Uh, Actually, why, why, why is tough. Really? You're kidding. <laughs> Is another well, question? No, I think we're just about done. Okay. And uh, it's kind of sad. This is the last uh, day of this five day thing we've done. Maybe we'll come back and do something more in the future, but this is it. If you guys want to, if you are watching and, and uh, you have other people you want to have watch this, um, we'll post where you can, uh, get the other four days on uh on youtube i'll put it up on my social media stuff and uh i'm sure you will too jack and jerry and stuff so you can watch them because they've all been recorded and it's been great fun this week doing this it it has been great fun and i'll put it up on on uh facebook as well um i'll yeah. i'll write it out take a picture help to put it up too yep good well Ladies, do you think this is the end, Roland, or are we going to do this again? Well, we'll have to talk about it. We'll have to rest over the weekend and yeah. figure out what we want to do next. Yeah. I know that there's been so many comments um, just on the YouTube channel. I didn't, I, I didn't post every comment, but there are so many people are so grateful that you've taken the time this week. Um, especially today, they loved hearing some of these stories. Ellie got a lot of, uh, I don't know, Jamie, if you've been watching, but a lot of, you know, praise on the YouTube as well. So it's been an incredible week. And Jerry, I have to say, you had this idea. Um, and look how quickly you put an idea together with two of your friends that the three of you have been on the road together for however many years, visited, I don't know what that number is. What is it? 30 years on the road together. And how many schools have you visited? We think about 10,000 between the three of us. Wow. Well, uh, it was like an absolute gift to have the three of you. It was like, uh, you know, we've said this. It's been like we just all kind of had this gift that we were sitting around a virtual table, um, getting to listen to the conversations and the stories and lots of unbelievable laughs this week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank great you ladies for having us. Great Thanks for putting it together. Yes. Thank Absolutely. You. Behind the scenes, that's all we did. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I know that you know if people get in touch with you, that you know want some sort of session they can record and then broadcast out to their students, because sometimes people don't want you live looking into their students' house, you know, so they would want want it recorded and then they could broadcast it out, you know, so that you don't have a live student audience, you have a live teacher audience. Mm -hmm. And I know that you can arrange such things. Absolutely. Ab yeah, absolutely. And that's just a great, uh, we, there's so many unknowns about when that next date that students are going to be able to go back to school. So right. what a wonderful opportunity uh, for the three of you. If any of those schools that have canceled on you wanted to bring you in just for their school, um, yeah. you know, this wouldn't, what we've just done live would be not what you could do for school. It would be private, it would just be, and I, as a parent, I think what a great opportunity for a school to bring that um, type of learning while parents are scrambling um, to really make learning authentic while we're all at home. Uh, I, I think so too. And I, I think it would be uh, a real refresher for any one of us to, to you know, have a 45 minute session that, that a librarian or a teacher could blast out to their students and say, let's do this. Let's listen to this. Let's look at how this book is made. Let's look at how this story developed and, and meet this person who's giving us encouragement to keep it going. Because eventually we're going to get through this time. Yes. And, uh, and we by all- the way, look, and, By the and, way, looking back on the week, I think my favorite story is your friend who is spinning around in his chair. <laughs> I think that was my favorite story of the week. So Jack, you win coolest story of the week. Who uh, would win? Uh, that, that, that's yeah. a little, 
Joey. <laughs> I love Thank you guys so much. We we've had a blast, and we're going to be uh, closing up this YouTube live. But feel free to still share this out with your students, um, with teachers, certainly those that are out there aspiring authors. I mean, all of this information has been really helpful, and will remain on YouTube and active for you to be able to share as well. So we thank you guys for joining in, and we look forward to connecting again here soon. Have a great day, Roland. Roland, I'm very happy you caught your mother. Oh, yeah, man. See you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Pleasure.